Okay, well, welcome back to Pop Gnosis. This is an episode of Talk Gnosis. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the phenomenon everybody's talking about, which is Barbie. I'm Jason Memmel, and I'm joined with my co-host, Rebecca Skolnick. Say hi, hi. Rebecca. <laughs> so, if you're new to Gnosticism, the absolute shortest way I can describe it is a kind of deeper knowing. Something that you can't be uh, be taught or you or learn, but you can discover often through faith, through mystical exploration, philosophy, or my personal favorite, art. It can be described as remembering a deep connection, something you didn't know you forgot. And there's a lot of traditions, a lot of classic and old, uh, old traditions that have whole cosmologies of figures that are either trying to keep us from remembering, remembering that connection, or are in the way of remembering. And so on pop gnosis, what we do is we try to, try to take a look at culture around us through a Gnostic lens. Sometimes the connections are easy and direct and, and uh, easy to process. Sometimes they're lurking underneath and have to be interpreted. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, and we're going to jump into Barbie, which maybe the one thing I might note right off the bat is that uh, I think Greta Gerwig has said that she was directly inspired by the Garden of Eden and things like that. So we're maybe not we're not um, speculating as much on some of these reaches as uh, as we might on some of our other movies. But uh, great. Well, so yeah, do you, uh, B, do you want to take a first crack at the at the first part of the synopsis and then we'll go back and forth? Yeah, let's do it. Um, in case you're living under a rock and you have not seen Barbie, <laughs> um, stereotypical Barbie, played by Margot Robbie, lives in Barbie land, which is a place where all of the women, all of the Barbies have amazingly fulfilling jobs and where all of the Kens, specifically stereotypicals, counterpoint ken whose job is beach so <laughs> um, he's not a lifeguard he his job is just beach um, so beach ken wants to be seen by barbie uh, and they believe that they represent the ideals of women and you know ken has no idea about really about the ideals of men yet <laughs> spoiler alert um, but stereotypical barbie assumes that barbie land is reflected in the real world and uh, so later on that day, stereotypical Barbie is in the middle of a dance sequence. It's amazing. Like everything's kind of reaching this great culmination of happiness and togetherness. And then she's struck with this thought of mortality. Um, and then this this uh, develops into her next day not being nearly as perfect as the day before. Um, up to this point, every day had been perfect. And now this, this day is not perfect. Um, her feet go from being automatically arched as though she were wearing... Um, uh, uh, like, uh, what do you call them? Heels. Heels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the noun just escapes me. Um, so yeah. She, so, uh, her, her, from automatically arched to flat feet, um, she gets bad breath. She develops cellulite. Oh, the cellulite is so funny in the, <laughs> in the movie. Uh, so obviously she has to figure out what is happening to her. So she goes to the only Barbie who can really understand Weird Barbie and Weird Barbie lives kind of in Barbie land, but above and away from the other Barbies. And she represents the versions of Barbie dolls who have been uh, damaged or modified chaotically. Like they've been <laughs> played with too hard is the idea. So mm -hmm. she, her hair has been cut. She has been drawn on uh, and her legs are always in the splits or going in wild directions. <laughs> Exactly. Um, uh, they they believe, the, the conversation they have, lead her to believe that the girl playing with stereotypical Barbie has been having these thoughts about, about mortality, about life, and which is flowing back to stereotypical Barbie. And um, uh, this might also be a great moment to note that um, Barbie at this point feels like she doesn't look like Barbie anymore, at which point there is an author's note uh, like a, a sort of a, a voice over the film that literally says, Margot Robbie may not be the best person to cast <laughs> if you're trying to make this point. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And by the way, Helen Mirren is my celebrity hall pass. So to mm -hmm. have her narrate this film was <laughs> a pleasure. <laughs> yes. So uh, there, here now we have this link between what is the real world and what is Barbie land. And so Weird Barbie says that stereotypical Barbie needs to go to the real world and find the girl who is playing with her and feeling troubled. 
And Barbie is initially hesitant. She does not want to go on this quest, uh, but ultimately she is compelled. She already knows too much. She's already, like you said, changed too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she sets off uh, on course to the real world and stowed away in the backseat of her car is her Ken, uh, <laughs> is, is Beach Ken, <laughs> and who's tagging along to the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Barbie ha gets to the real world. She like encounters all kinds of, um, uh, I skipped over this when I, when I wrote the, uh, the synopsis, uh, she encounters all kinds of, um, different layers of humanity. She encounters people, um, looking at her with sexual intent, which she's not used to. Um, uh, she sees a, uh, a an old woman who she just finds incredibly beautiful, um, but she finally makes her way to a school where she thinks she finds the girl that she's looking for, uh, this girl who is bitter and cynical, um, and, but she's sharply rebuffed. She's uh, like the, the, the young woman says, basically says that Barbie is what's wrong with, with uh, uh, capitalism. It's like, it's a really great takedown. And, and then Barbie uh, has the best line in the whole, maybe the whole movie where she goes, she thinks I'm a fascist. I don't like, I don't, handle the flow of commerce or the railways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which actually that's even that's even an important note too is cuz the world Barbie comes from is all about all the Barbies have jobs. Like mm -hmm. they're scientists and the president and like doctors and lawyers and they all have valid, powerful, responsible jobs. Um and that that's the world that Barbie thought she'd find in the real world. And so this is part of why she's so shocked by this. Um, uh, so she's sharply rebuffed. She's captured by Mattel, the literal company that makes Barbie, um, who are trying to limit the impact of Barbies entering the real world. So it's, it's indicated that Mattel knows that Barbie land is a thing and that Barbies can make the way make their way to the real world and they want to keep that from happening. But this um, has happened before. There was a skipper sighting yes. like yes. years before. <laughs> yeah. So they're very upset that this has happened again, and especially yes. because it's Barbie this time. So like mm -hmm. they could have covered it up before. They're going to have a lot harder of a time to cover up like Barbie herself coming to the real world. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, what was the, the last part of this? Oh, yeah. So she... Um, she ends up escaping the Mattel uh, like before they before they can fully trap her and send her back. Um, and while she's while she's escaping, um, she is saved by the mother of the young girl that she met at school, who happens to work at the same at Mattel. And and it's this mother that had had the concerns that had been f having these thoughts of death and you know questioning her role in the world. Um, do you want to do you want to take this next? I totally do. <laughs> Great. So meanwhile, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, uh, Ken has been out in Century City, Los Angeles, <laughs> learning the ways of the world, obviously. And he realizes that in the real world, men are in charge. And he specifically has kind of met with these stereotypical uh, masculine, like gym culture, um, Sir Sylvester Stallone in a fur coat, mm -hmm. everyone on horseback. And so he <laughs> is overjoyed, honestly, with this new idea that men are the Barbies of the real world and that he could have <laughs> some kind of purpose here. And so, but at the same time, he's getting this very stereotypical <laughs> idea of men <laughs> and patriarchy, um, which he thinks is all about horses. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and ultimately he, I think this is later on in your lovely synopsis, but he brings back the ideas of patriarchy to Barbie land kind of on his own. This is mm -hmm. where, stereotypical Barbie and Ken separate in their journeys. And so mm -hmm. he makes his way back to Barbie land with these notions of patriarchy. Exactly. Um, so now that, that Barbie and the mother are connected, uh, Barbie wants to take the mother back to Barbie land so that she can see at least in Barbie land, all the things that women can do and be, she wants to inspire her, uh, uh, the, per the person she, who's giving her these thoughts. Um, this is still Barbie trying to solve the problem of of her imperfections. If she can fix the mother, then she can fix herself. Um, 
And uh, so when she gets to Barbie land, she discovers that Ken has actually has been so entranced with this idea of patriarchy, despite not really understanding what patriarchy is, um, just that it has something to do with horses and men being in charge. Um, he's transformed Barbie land into basically like a very bro space. Um, and he wants to turn it into a place where men are in charge. He's, he, they're, they're setting something up where if the men vote for this particular thing, then the magical land of Barbie land, I think, turns into, is, is it just Ken land or did they have another term for it? it's like it? Kendom, right? Kendom, like yeah. like a, a kingdom, but it's Kendom. Yeah. yeah. And he turns, uh, he turns Barbie's dream house into Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa house. <laughs> <laughs> Which then, in the real world, all of a sudden, this toy exists now. So it's fun to watch, yes. like, the worlds interact with each other and what happens in each world, like, affects the other world. Because in the real world, there is this overarching narrative that, like, Barbie is the most popular toy and the money maker, and no one really cares about Ken. Mm -hmm. And then when Ken brings patriarchy back to Barbie land and creates this Mojo Dojo Casa house, all of a sudden <laughs> that toy exists and it's flying off the shelves in the real world. So it's fun to see the, the world's like twist. And what a term, the Mojo Dojo Casa house. Like that is <laughs> so fun to say. And every time they say it in the movie, I laugh. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So this this kind of depresses Barbie. Like watching all this happen, you know, she's like she um, she felt like a failure, or like that she was turning into a failure before she left Barbie Land. Um, Barbie's or her the 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 mother, uh, sorry the the daughter, really takes down Barbie as a concept. And then when Barbie tries to show them how great Barbie Land is, even that has been taken away. So Barbie's kind of at her at her lowest possible moment. And uh, then the mother sort of inspires her or or like reengages her by outlining how incompatible uh, or how conflicting the expectations are around women or and and uh, and feminine individuals in in terms of how they're expected to be both like you know like um, a virgin and a mother or they're expected to be you know um, uh, like funny but not too funny that th th these kinds of things like she sort of makes all these lists which are, are fabulous and, and an incredibly strong part of the movie yeah, and then they team up with Weird Barbie and, oh, oh, also all of the Barbies in Barbie land now have oh. been brainwashed into believing yeah. patriarchy. So like the Nobel Prize winner is now um, just giving Ken's foot massages mm -hmm. or bringing them new beers. You know, they've, mm -hmm. uh, they've relegated all of the women to what Ken's are kind of in, in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the bar stereotypical Barbie, weird Barbie, and yes, the mother and the daughter, they set out on this quest to free the minds of all the other Barbies by explaining them patriarchy and these conflicting expectations of women. Mm -hmm. And then in their plan, they also manipulate the Kens into becoming jealous of one another or kind of acting on some of those uh, other stereotypes for men and going to war with each other and attacking each other so that the Barbies can regain control of Barbie land. Mm -hmm. And I and and this in this whole plot, you know, is really interesting as well because through it. The Kens aren't just relegated back to the Kens. There is this kind of Barbie land realization that Ken does deserve to be autonomous and mm -hmm. fully formed and, and his own person outside of just his connection to Barbie and mm -hmm. like wanting and needing her attention. And I think like what's interesting, like what you said there too, about how the, the Kens make the Barbies just like the Kens were, like in the sense of the, the what their focus is. I think it's important underlining that because it is the the Kens, uh, and particularly Beach Ken, um, Ryan Gosling Beach Ken, um, uh, who's perfect in the role, is uh, his main goal is to be seen by Barbie and be and so and be validated by Barbie. And uh, this is this is what it what all the all of the women turn into all of the barbies turn into when uh when ken takes over and i think that's such a yeah it's just really worth underlining because it's such a great way 
for men to get a or for ma masculine individuals to get a sense of what that what that uh, um, assumption of need is that is I think so often invisible if you're not paying attention to it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Oh, I guess that's me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so then at this point, everybody, the um, Will Ferrell plays the CEO of Mattel, which we mm. haven't really talked about yet. And he has this group of other, you know, the CFO, like the heads, the board of Mattel are all men. And that's mm -hmm. a running joke as well. It's like, where are the women making the women's <laughs> toys? Um, and so at this point in the movie, all of the Mattel men have made it to Barbie land themselves. Mm -hmm. And so all of the humans are there for this big like end, end moment of, mm -hmm. of change in Barbie land. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, we reach this moment and uh, I think like the, the Mattel are the Mattel individuals are happy for Barbie land to return to something of what it was, was before with this new element of Ken's being able to be enough on their own, uh, to be Ken enough. Um, uh, but then Barbie gets a chance to meet Ruth, um, the first designer of Barbie. In fact, actually, this is her second meeting with Ruth. She has a brief encounter with her earlier in the film. Um, yeah, when she's, she's escaping Mattel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and that's a sort of a more mysterious meeting. But in this one, Bar Ruth shows up and and gives Barbie the choice to either remain in Barbie land and become and sort of regain her perfect Barbie status again, uh, or go into the real world and be fully human. This, which will mean not just um, uh, being a woman, but but dying eventually. Like she will, she'll become mortal as well. Um, and uh, she will also not be defined by anyone other than her. She can choose her own direction. She chooses to. She chooses the real world. Takes the name. Barbara Handler, which I think is coming from Ruth Handler, the name of the yeah, it's the Barbie name. Side. And Barbie was named and designed for Ruth's daughter, so uh, who was named Barbara Handler. So okay. she takes on kind of the identity mm, of yeah. the dog of the daughter. Not really, not in a government way, but like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, spiritually, yeah. metaphorically. <laughs> exactly. um, uh, and then the movie ends with her uh, going to her first gynecology appointment because now she because she's human now she now has actual reproductive organs and she has like genitals which she, she did genitals. not have before and she was exactly. very ready to tell people yeah about her lack of genitals which... and about ken's lack of genitals <laughs> yes which actually we definitely don't need to get into this first but i think there was a, we're we're going to talk about uh greta gerwig's uh catholic upbringing and mm -hmm. how a lot of these ideas and stories and imagery were directly kind of influenced from a biblical story and especially like a reverse of the Garden of Eden story. Mm -hmm. um, having instead of Eve being made for Adam, we have Ken being made for Barbie. Uh, but there's also a lot of um, really cool information from Margot Robbie about the decision to make Barbie asexual, mm. which I think is really interesting. Um, to watch your, you mentioned it earlier that when she first gets to the real world, she's sexualized in this way that she has never been before. And that really jars, you know, is jarring to her. Mm -hmm, um, but mm -hmm. even before, like the story that Mattel wants Barbie to carry out and to live has to do with her relationship with Ken, but she doesn't love Ken and she rebukes his affections in, you know, even in the beginning of the movie before yeah, yeah. going to Barbie land. So that that was deliberate to play Barbie as an asexual character throughout mm -hmm. um, because not only to highlight how we've inherently sexualized plastic, you know, as <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. as kind of this weird cognitive dissonance of why have we done that and mm -hmm. look, making us look at that choice. Um, but also, I think that's really interesting representation, which then the final moments of the film do bring into question, like whether or not now that she's a human being, mm -hmm. is she going, you know, now that she's mortal, is she going to have genitalia and explore her sexuality and whatnot. We don't know. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I thought there were interesting choices made throughout. Totally. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And there's so many thoughts even on that, like regarding, um, uh, like, I mean, one thing we didn't even touch on is that the, the movie actually starts with, a uh, a, a sort of a parody of the beginning of 2001, a space odyssey, um, uh, with this idea of, um, in, like that the way that the monolith in 2001 lets the, the, um, like early humans develop tools. Um, Barbie lets women transition from pretending to be mothers with their toys to being themselves to be identified to, with the to, toys. Yeah, exactly. To identify with the toy, to not, not, not play with the toy as an analog for, for another role they have to take on, but to play with the toy as an analog for themselves and to, and for those jobs to be the jobs that the Barbies would have would be the jobs that those women could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, she becomes inspirational and mm -hmm. uh, to a figure of like, well, if Barbie can do anything, then you can do anything which then is really fun to see when Barbie goes to the real world, she has this idea and all the Barbies do that they'll be like applauded in the real world. Yeah. That they'll get there and every then women will want to hug them and thank them for mm -hmm. kind of revealing all of these different paths that they could take. And so that makes the real world, the fall, you know, that much greater when she gets to the real world in realizing that, not only has Barbie not paved the way for women to have all of these jobs or be mm -hmm. um, celebrated or powerful in the ways that they are in, in Barbie land, but then Barbie in the real world actually represents everything that is terrible or stereo again, stereotypical about a mm -hmm. woman. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Like the, the, and uh, it's so smart how the movie allows for its own critique, if that makes sense. Like it's mm -hmm. um, uh, it allows, like it doesn't let the question of Barbie's problematic elements uh, just be ignored, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and going back to your space odyssey, I think that's a good way to, <laughs> to get us into religious imagery or Gnosticism in regards mm. to Barbie, because it is a shot for shot remake yes. <laughs> of it's not just a parody. Like it is yeah. a shot for shot recreation of the mm -hmm. beginning of 2001, a space odyssey with Barbie and it's brilliant and hilarious. And you can find the shot for shot like videos <laughs> online now. Um, but the idea of movies being intrinsic to this movie like other movies being intrinsic to the Barbie movie mm. was also a deliberate part of Greta Gerwig's process. So the film shot in London and every Sunday she would have the cast and crew go to a theater and watch a classic movie or a movie that was on her list of inspirations for the Barbie movie. And they mm. called it movie church. Oh, wow. So, oh, wow. uh, which I love. And so <laughs> they would go to movie church every Sunday as a full cast and kind of worship at the altar of the craft, which I thought was, that's it's just amazing. a really cool nugget of information. Oh, I mean, like, I think that's kind of what we're doing here now. Yeah. Is like, you know, uh, uh, movie church or like culture church, art, totally. art church, you know? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, thank you for saying that. That's, yeah. yeah. Um, so okay, well, so we've got some some folks on uh, online, like on Discord and on Reddit, who asked us some questions. Um, but I'm actually wondering if maybe like we could even d make some of those Gnostic connections first ish, because I think some of them will answer those questions or they'll help. If anyone else is listening who doesn't know Gnosticism as much, then they won't, they might have a little bit more information by the time we answer the more nitty gritty questions we got online. Um, uh, yeah, one so, of the questions, I had to look up a word. I was like, I have no idea what this person is talking about. Is that the paraclete one? Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I think I know, but I'm going to, I'm going to double check this. I looked it up too. Totally. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So like, I think for me, um, the, one of the, the, so the um, the divine feminine in Gnosticism is often something that I I have a lot of attraction to, and I think a lot of folks have attraction to in Gnosticism is that there is a a um, a feminine figure that isn't defined by by um, 
the fall, you know, or not directly, mm -hmm. I suppose. I guess maybe she also is, but it's, she's connected to both, um, which is Sophia wisdom. Um, rather than it just being Eve eating an apple and then everything else goes bad, um, Sophia is kind of lives in this like it, eternal realm, but then starts to think about uh, about what the 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 lower realms might be like, and in the in the thinking about that, moves into them and sort of becomes affected by it, modified by it. Um, and in some cases, that's also kind of a creation story. Like her her mistake is to dwell on thinking about the material world, which creates the material world. Mm -hmm. And that the movie has that element where if Barbie didn't have that moment of mortality, which she would have because of because of the person playing with her, but if she didn't have that moment of mortality, then the movie would never have gone to the real world. You know? Well, we would have within the movie been able to accept all of its claims as fact, you know. Um of course, well, that and Barbie be probably movie. wouldn't. Barbie probably wouldn't think about the real world either that much. Like there's exactly. so much going on. There's this full reality for them mm -hmm. here that it's not until she uh, has that brilliant. You guys ever think about dying? <laughs> like <laughs> she has that brilliant. And then like moment. record scratch. <laughs> I know. Well, because it feels like it almost takes her by surprise too. Yeah. And that that. Um, you can feel free to to tell me to save it for later. But I feel like <laughs> that moment actually, in terms of Gnosticism being like what a remembering or something that we know that we didn't know we knew until we knew it, like mm -hmm. that the innocence with which that moment kind of bubbles up out of nowhere mm. does seem to be an interesting Gnostic reveal mm -hmm. in that. I don't even think she was aware that that thought lived anywhere inside of her yeah, yeah, until yeah. all of a sudden it did. And you can make the claim that it's not her thought, it's someone else's, but it definitely permeates, you know, mm -hmm. her, and changes her world. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then leads us to the rest of the rest of the world that we know. I think it's also maybe something that you were saying there that I think is interesting of uh, that, that like, um, Barbie land can on one hand be seen as maybe an analog for heaven or like the, like the Plato's idea around the realm of ideal forms, you know, so things are supposed to be quote unquote better there, or, you know what I mean? More totalizing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think what's interesting is that it's not actually true to get to even run further with your point, I think is that um, it, her having that Gnostic moment is her getting to a place where then she can finally, by the end of the movie, fully embrace that more totalizing wisdom, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. that she couldn't mm -hmm. before. Like she wouldn't be capable of, or not, she obviously is capable. She she goes there, but like, um, I don't know. D does that make sense? Like that she's yeah. kind of getting to the, 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 the surface truth is Barbie land, or rather the surface truth is that Barbie land is good. You know? mm -hmm. um, well, and the whole thing reveals the flaws of Barbie land as well, mm -hmm. which if you had asked stereotypical Barbie on when we meet her, Barbie land is perfect. No problems here. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think men now I'm going to be very general, but men being yeah. very angry about the Barbie movie is quite funny to me because I think they miss the point of the end, which is that Barbie stereotypical Barbie realizes that Barbie land was not better because Ken was not a fully formed person in mm -hmm. Barbie land. And so, uh, you know, again, we won't know exactly what changes they made in order to give Ken the Ken's more of an equal ground, mm -hmm. but the movie is very clear in that it says like, we're not swapping one way of, patriarchy for matriarchy, we need to tear both, like neither one of those systems are serving the whole. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to, yeah. to make Ken more of a person here and like women more, more, more real in the real world? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that, but that is a huge thing too. Like I've heard that too, people saying that the movie's about hating men. And I'm like, that is not the message I got from it. 
because like literally the men are saying that they are enough on their own that they don't need to be defined by anyone else and that is an empowering statement like that is that is not a statement of a movie that says thinks that men are terrible you know um, yeah yeah um and like i think like one thing that i've often heard uh said around this too is the like patriarchy in the in by looking at it as a as a system of male supremacy can hurt men as well mm -hmm. um and that it's not like a, a patriarchy isn't necessarily a, a cabal of you know like you know men in a boardroom somewhere deciding the world um in a very ex explicit way although i think there are parts of it that there are people who make decisions that way like intentionally to keep people down but it's that the system is so ingrained and so historical that we take for granted things that we didn't or um we take for we take as truth things that are only actually like choices made many like hundreds or thousands of years ago um which is also i mean i'm kind of bouncing around here a bit but like that's one of the the amazing things about the way this movie approaches things is it really allows through its sense of humor the like the ability to kind of crack through a lot of those assumptions around mm. the way things should be or or just naturally are if that makes sense and so um like uh, one of my gnostic philo philosophical parallels was that seeing patriarchy as a limiting system the way that like archons are often seen as as in control of certain parts of the world that are limiting us and that like that yeah patriarchy can be a limiting system um even if you are male and benefiting from it you know um yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that comes across too in the personality changes of the Kens once mm -hmm. patriarchy comes into Barbie land uh, and how the Kens themselves have to be. And, you mm -hmm. know, Ken, like Ryan Gosling, Beach Ken um, has always been pretty emotional. And <laughs> then at the end, like, cries but has this moment of like I can't be crying because I'm a man under patriarchy now and so yeah I, it does have this moment of like it is limiting to men because it's saying just kind of like how Ken's kind of were in Barbie land before um they're it's saying like in the real world under patriarchy then there's only one way for a man to be as well you must mm -hmm. be all of these stereotypical characteristics of masculine and that's not accurate to their individualized experiences either like exactly. I love the moment where he's like I don't need to wear this fur coat anymore and like <laughs> gives it to another Ken um <laughs> because that was him like you know shirking this this uh the prison that patriarchy became for him as well exactly yeah yeah exactly um uh yeah which and so like maybe in terms of limiting systems this might be maybe a good point to talk about the demiurge as a mm -hmm. like a, usually the person in charge of the limiting system what i think is interesting here is like a lot of gnostic cosmology particularly i would say the ones that are that uh like really took hold a lot in modern gnosticism um and like in movies like the matrix uh, see the demiurge and archons as a as a as a specifically negative um malevolent force um, okay. What I thought was really interesting here is that with Mattel as a in sort of a demiurgic figure, they they control Barbie Land or have some level of control over Barbie Land, um, or try to. <laughs> um, uh, but they but they don't have total control. They don't have total power, and are often as affected by things as the as the real world and Barbie Land are. Like, it's it's the it's Mattel that has to go. Like, what are we going to do with all these? Um, uh, what is it? Masa Casa? Uh, oh, the Mojo Dojo Casa House. But Mojo Dojo Casa House. There we go. Yeah, like <laughs> it's they're caught by surprise by this. Like, um, mm -hmm. and so I think that that to me is interesting. And I think there are forms of classical Gnosticism and contemporary Gnosticism that do acknowledge that the demiurge might not uh, might not be best defined solely as a as a as a jailer as somebody trying to keep you down um and might be as trapped by the system as anyone else um uh you know say like misguided but not actually against being corrected see i love this because 
in Gnostic cosmology, the demiurge is kind of the middleman between, mm -hmm. like, he is a, or the, he, the demiurge is a <laughs> creator. I know, I've, like, Barbie and its gender politics is obviously another episode, <laughs> so <laughs> yes, I just yeah. really apologize to everyone <laughs> listening. I'm being very incredibly binary in this moment. Yeah. Um, but the demiurge in Gnostic cosmology stories is a creator, of course, but is not the creator. Like there is the one of, mm -hmm. of the monad kind of above, I guess, in the mm -hmm. cosmology story. And then also Sophia exists before the demiurge as well. Mm -hmm. And so I do like this idea that Mattel being the creators, quote unquote, because Ruth, you know, without Ruth, they wouldn't have anything. These, these men wouldn't have anything to to build or create or profit off of, but mm -hmm. that Mattel kind of the company is a creator, but also did not create in this case, the real world and don't have as much control. They're kind of just exploiting mm -hmm. um, the real world. But yes, I love the idea that they're surprised by it as well. And there's this great moment where the mother America Ferreira plays uh, who plays the mother who basically is the reason that all of this is happening, you know, mm -hmm. her cynical thoughts about the world. And she says, why don't we just make ordinary Barbie? Because every woman just wants to get through the day, like wearing a nice blouse, feeling kind of good about herself. <laughs> <laughs> and the Mattel CEO is like, absolutely not. Nobody's going to buy ordinary Barbie. And then one guy with an iPad is like, actually, that would make a lot of money. And they're like, we love ordinary Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I do love the idea of them kind of as, as this misguided demiurge that mm -hmm. uh, has creative power and chutzpah, but doesn't, yeah, is not fully malevolent. They're not, you know, they don't know mm -hmm. what they are doing and are, are kind of buffoons at, at certain points of the movie for sure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, which I think also like, because I, I, what I, what I often see as the, the kind of the, the, the trap or the danger of some of that more, um, uh, like negative world focused Gnosticism that like the, you know, the Demiurge is evil, the world is evil. We need to get out of here kind of thing is, um, and we need to like, you know, like avoid everything is that it can, it can be very world hating, which can become like kind of very nihilistic and such. And it also, um, uh, it, like, it becomes an easy uh, a, a way to avoid engaging with anything that you can change. Um, and uh, what, whereas here, I think, like, the fact that everyone involved seems to be capable of some kind of change, goes through some kind of change, it, to me, I think that that's a really interesting way to approach um, a sort of a gnostic -y spiritual angle on this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can we go back to a hot take that I have about the Sophia figure in Barbie? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. So I think there are actually many Sophia figures. Yes, there are. Throughout. Yes. I think that if I were to look at Barbie through the lens of the divine feminine, I really do think every female character or every woman in Barbie is the divine feminine to a mm -hmm. certain extent. Um, but I actually think the first Sophia figure in the Barbie movie is weird Barbie. Oh, didn't see that coming. Nice. Yeah. Which um, <laughs> maybe this is a spoiler alert for one of our listener questions, but someone asked, you know, is the Mattel CEO played by Will Ferrell, the Demiurge figure in, in the story and if so, is Ruth Handler, the like original creator of Barbie, is she the Sophia? Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of the movie, she absolutely is the Sophia and that she comes to Barbie land and offers stereotypical Barbie a choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that Weird Barbie is the first Sophia character in terms of the um, cosmology story of the Garden of Eden, if we're looking at it reversed, she's actually the snake figure or the, you know, the Sophia figure who comes to Barbie and offers her a choice 
the first choice. She's mm -hmm. the one who says there is a real world. There is Barbie land. Here's how they're connected. This is what's happening. She's actually the first character that delivers this divine knowledge mm -hmm. of how everything works and uh, really validates what Barbie is experiencing through her flat feet and her cellulite and her <laughs> not perfect day. Um, who says, you're right, there is, you know, peek behind the veil, I will show you because she's already been like drawn on and cut to shit. <laughs> um, and then there's this amazing moment where Weird Barbie holds out a high heel and a Birkenstock and says, yes. you must make a choice, <laughs> which I know Barbie's not gay, but I was like, take the gay sandal. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, take the lesbian sandal. Do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but she she says, you know, you can choose the heel, which is go back to your life in Barbie land and just ignore everything that you now know. Or you can take the Birkenstock and you can go, you know, to the real world and, and go on this adventure mm -hmm. of further illumination and and wisdom and knowledge and experience. And I love that. Mo and Barbie was is like, I'm going to pick the heel. Like, I do not yeah. want to know. And ultimately, she's like, no, we need to try that again. Like, you have yeah. to pick. <laughs> you have to go. You have to pick this one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that the first, in my opinion, my humble opinion, the first Sophia character uh, is, is weird Barbie. You know? Yeah. I think that's well. So one of the other, uh, listeners online, um, uh, Nate said they, they could name a few details like weird Barbie with the snake pants. Oh, cool. So, so like, yeah, it like, I, I think the end, uh, uh, Greta Gerwig has said that she's, there's a garden of Eden metaphor in this whole thing. There so is, like, yeah. Yeah, like I, the, I would uh, also the fact that uh, Barbie has her eye drawn in a circle, like there's a circle drawn around her eye. You know, um, I'm not as familiar on my uh, symbolism on that stuff, but like, yeah, like this person who can see things differently, um, uh, is see like is sort of living in that interstices between worlds, mm -hmm. um, which is also kind of Sophia's whole thing is like, you know, her she wants to help humanity by letting it have wisdom if that makes sense, like by giving it Gnosis or like helping it get to Gnosis. Um, uh, but then at the same time, because this movie is a comedy, there's a, there's like the, the whole thing with the choice is like, you know, in the matrix, it's like red pill or blue pill. And yes. in, in here it's like, you know, he, <laughs> what if, what if uh, Lawrence Fishburne said, no, 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 you don't get that pill. You have to take this one. Like I love yeah. the, I, I love that inversion of the moment that we all already know that like, everybody seeing this movie knows that the hero is supposed to take the brave choice. And so for Barbie to not want it and for weird Barbie to force her to take it is great. <laughs> well, and I think that that means, you know, there will be another, like if we're talking about choice as a concept and mm -hmm. as a Gnostic concept as well, right? We can choose to continue to remember and to mm -hmm. explore and to connect these dots. Or we can not, you know, we can take mm -hmm. our high heel and we can go back to the world that we see in front of us and and carry on. But I think the idea that the choice has been taken away mm -hmm. from Barbie, like she has she doesn't have a choice. She is going to go on the adventure actually makes the choice at the end the real choice. Do exactly. you now knowing everything that you know? Yeah. Um, do you want to stay in the garden or do you want to go to the real world? And so um, we haven't talked about it yet, but in that moment, I do think Ruth is another Sophia figure of mm -hmm. imparting wisdom, you know, and knowledge to Barbie in order for her to then make an empowered choice. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I did not expect to weep at the Barbie movie, but <laughs> let me tell you that montage that they cut together of mm -hmm. very normal women throughout life, like that Barbie sees through Ruth um, mm -hmm. saying like, this is the soul of women and this is the choice you're making. This is the legacy that you're joining. Like I thought there was something so simple and beautiful and emotional about that montage i saw it twice and i cried both times mm, yeah no i i was like i i think i cried maybe three or four times in that movie <laughs> and like 
I'm not an easy crier. I'm not a hard crier either. Like it, if it's if it's well done, I'll get there. But like, yeah, I did. I was not expecting that many that many feels and that many laughs. Like I thought it would be funny, but I didn't know it'd be that funny. Like <laughs> very funny, very funny. Yeah, and um, I I mean, there's no. There's no Gnostic. If somebody can find me the Gnostic tie-in of this moment, I would love to hear it. But <laughs> one of my favorite moments of the whole movie is them singing, the Ken's singing Push by Matchbox 20. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where could we go with this? I mean, I know. <laughs> jo Jonathan has pointed out that sometimes like when we make correlations, um, it, we're really just pursuing the like, dopamine hit of making a connection like even whether or not it's valid which is fair but like just for the sake of argument like even if Greta Gerwig didn't mean anything by it what what could you do with that I know like, it's musical there's maybe a sense of a hymn of some kind maybe um uh but it's also the moment that the Barbies use to to turn the Kens on each other um uh, yeah, like it, what? What is that? Like, or the the context of it being a beach, is that it's like, <laughs> it's you know, it's like the, like almost like like a fake heaven that's been constructed, like that they are. It honestly yeah. just reminded me of like every youth pastor with a guitar <laughs> that I've ever met in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's yes. there's the diet. <laughs> You know, yeah, like that, that, that sort of the, the, the person who's playing guitar because he knows or because he thinks that'll get him laid. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, not because yeah. he wants to play guitar, not because he loves playing guitar, but because he's going to learn this one song and he's going to play it on the beach and he hopes that somebody's going to talk to him, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a distinct uh, Gnostic connection. I don't think there is, but if anyone wants to find one. Yes, yeah, please. say so in the comments. We'll we'll do a second show just on that note. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Um, cool, okay. Well, I'm gonna do a quick Patreon plug and then uh, we're going to get back into, uh, into some other notes here. Um, so yeah, if you're enjoying listening to us talk about this, if you like us digging into um, uh, pop culture, um, classical Gnostic studies, academia on the subject. Uh, Patreon is the best way to support us doing that. Um, I'm going to see if I can bring up our banners. Yeah, so we've got like patreon.com slash Gnostic. We've got uh, paypal.me slash Gnostic, and we'll have all of these in the show notes, um, which are great ways to, yeah, show your support for the kind of work we're doing. Help us make more of it. Um, the, the, the more support we have, the more often we can do this stuff. And uh, yeah, in general, it basically keeps things going, keeps the lights on, um, helps us buy movie tickets to go see movies like the Barbie movie so that we can uh, tell you what is Gnostic about them. Um, <laughs> yes, please send me to see Barbie again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That is our that is our one, number one reason we do this is so that we can go to the Barbie movie. <laughs> um Great. Okay. Yeah. So that, that moment of shilling is over. Um, what are some other, so yeah, so we actually kind of covered some of the questions here. Um, we did, but we didn't get to Paraclete, which no. I think that since this person knows that we should talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and it's also funny. So um, if it hasn't, uh, if we haven't made it clear, um, there is stereotypical Barbie, but there are many other Barbies in Barbie land. There's lawyer Barbie and Nobel prize winner Barbie and, like President Barbie, and so they're and they're all just named Barbie. They're all um, the same Barbie, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, which is useful for this question or important for this question. Um, so uh, Kathari Kavunt asks, would you say the Paraclete is best represented by Barbie, Barbie, or Barbie? My personal bet is on Barbie. All of that was was from the the, the post. Um, so uh, Paraclete. <laughs> which I, I had to look up as well, is it's it kind of like, uh, I mean, theology in all its forms can always get complicated, but a short, very short version is like an intercessor, somebody who helps us get from one place to another. Jesus can be seen as an intercessor, as a paraclete, um, uh, like Moses, you know, various f faiths and traditions have different paracletes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like, I think, I think you're right. It could be Barbie, Barbie, or Barbie. But I actually think my take is that it's Gloria. I think Gloria is actually the intercessor. Um, if, 
like uh, um, the mother. I don't think we've named mother. her yet. Sorry, Fair. Gloria. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, Gloria. We've done you so dirty. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's funny, all of the characters are named Barbie or Ken, but for some reason, most of the humans, I just didn't offer their names. At all. <laughs> At all. No, no. Just mother, daughter, um, <laughs> which, I mean, I'm I'm exemplifying their mythical positions anyway. But, um, like, we, uh, B, you made the great point that um, uh, she is kind of another Sophia figure in that sense of, like, really inciting a lot of these things, having the thoughts that cause a lot of this. Mm -hmm. But she is also that person who is, like, literally sitting in front of Barbies and telling them about the disconnections that are happening in the world. Um, uh, and, uh, and it, it, like, and by the nature of being the one who had the thoughts that started a lot of it, is that, like, quite literally that bridge between the worlds. Um, uh, so, yeah, I see her in that, paraclete figure perhaps and in the best way that i can say it the other thing we didn't talk about is that i mean there's so many things we didn't talk about and if you haven't seen the movie and any of this has convinced you like there is so much more than we than we have ever said here um but um there's this thing where, where um she works at mattel and she's drawing versions of barbie in fact, she's drawing versions of Barbie that are having the problems that are happening to stereotypical Barbie. Um, she is already so invested and connected to Barbie, but is also facing these problems with her life, that that's how so much of this gets started. Yeah. Yeah. I love those. Um, she, yeah, she drew like thoughts of death Barbie, <laughs> like literally <laughs> was what she called it. Um, <laughs> And I also loved her role. And I think this, okay, I, I again, I had to look up Paraclete. I was very <laughs> not familiar with the concept. So I will just be honest about that. Um, so I don't know if this supports the argument or or not that, that Gloria is this figure, but it's really interesting to me that she does have so much creative potential as well. Um, and she kind of is the only, or she is the only woman that we see working at Mattel. Mm -hmm. Because even Ruth doesn't work there. She's like in this mythical room that may or may not exist. We're not really yeah. sure what we're supposed to make of her <laughs> um, until the end where, you know, she does, she's played by Rhea, Rhea Perlman who makes the, comic moment perfect about like tax evasion which is real that's real about ruth handler like she lost mattel because she evaded taxes for so long <laughs> like that's how she lost control of the company so um so there's also something in there about like women this this figure not being able to hold on to her creation for other like patriarchal reasons mm -hmm. like the, the, you know taxes and this the system which i think is really interesting but Gloria is the only person, the only woman that we see working at Mattel yeah. and where all of these men can make decisions and clean up messes and seem to hold the power. Mm -hmm. Gloria is actually the old, maybe this is more in uh, Gloria as Sophia than, mm -hmm. than apparently, but Gloria ha actually has the creative power in the world that what mm -hmm. she draws happens in Barbie land because of this emotional and probably gendered connection mm -hmm. um, to the Barbie figure. But we never actually see men really create anything in the real world. The mm -hmm. only thing that affects Barbie um, in Barbie land is the one woman that works at Mattel and draws her real feelings into Barbies. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly it. And I think like it, the, um, I personally never see the uh, figures like the Paraclete or uh, the Archons or Sophia as like uh, rigidly defined structures that like, you know, that, that don't, um, that like, you know, uh, never the twain shall meet. Um, I think it's totally fair for, for Gloria to be both a Paraclete figure and a, uh, a Sophia figure, you know what I mean? To, to occupy both within the, within the, the process of the story, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, uh, that's super, that, that, uh, yeah. I like where you went there. <laughs> um, let's see if there's anything else on my, on my list. Um, 
Oh, well, I had a question for you. Oh, we yes. We have a question from Stargazer162. Hello. Uh, that is talking about, you had mentioned it before, like the details of Weird Barbie, like the snake pants, the eye in a circle, the pelican comment. I don't remember what the pelican comment is. Do you? <laughs> I don't remember the pelican comment either. And I'm right, not sure. Stargazer 162. Let us yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like either add to your, I think, that, I don't know if that was on Discord or Reddit, but like either add to that post, write in the comments, please give us more. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll dig into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I do feel that maybe there is a Barbie part two somewhere in our future, because I feel like this person in particular really was looking at some some symbolism and some finer, you know, some like very detailed things that I know exist in it. And for this initial conversation, obviously we took yeah. a little bit broader strokes. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I think we can definitely, well, this is the thing is like what makes it, I think when I came out of that movie, I said that I, I haven't seen a movie that smart mm. for a long time. Um, that movie, a movie that sure of itself, like that new what it was trying to say, knew every moment of, of the, the film in terms of what it was saying. Um, uh, that, 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 which means that that level of detail means that, that there's a lot that can sit with you and there's a lot that you can keep going with, you know, like we, we could talk probably for like four times as long as the movie itself, <laughs> yes. you know, just un unpacking things and noting things and having, and having fun doing it. Like, I think that's, that's amazing. Um, one thing that it wasn't in my notes that I noted that I didn't make it in my notes. And then I'm like, is this actually part of the point is Alan. Oh, Alan. <laughs> yes. We, Alan deserves to be spoken about. But only briefly. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> Alan. Yes. Take it away. Okay. Well, I, I don't, I don't have much <laughs> of a diagnostic take on it other than I think it's really interesting how um, uh, how this character is so it's played by Michael Sarah, and he's just sort of another adjunct character in Barbie Land. Who he's really Ken's has, friend. He's Ken's and friend. And he's a real and he's a real doll. He was Ken's yeah. friend, and Ken's his main claim is that all of Ken's clothes will fit him, so you don't have to buy more clothes for Alan <laughs> because he's not Ken, but Ken's clothes will fit him. Yes, that's his whole definition. <laughs> yeah, so like. I think, well, and uh, like Alan tries to help the weird Barbie and rest of the Barbie team um, in, in decoding everything. Um, uh, he tries to escape Barbie land when um, when Gloria and uh, and her daughter try to escape. Like, so he's present in the film. He does things. Um, he have, even fights off some of the Kens when... The, the... construction worker Kens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and yet the movie doesn't really do much with him which I think is interesting. And in a movie this smart, I wonder like, is like, if we assume it to be a choice, then where, where do we go with that? Like, where does he sit inside this sort of cosmology of things? Like, is um, Alan the paraclete? <laughs> I love that. I think, wait, a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I think we're onto something. <laughs> I wonder like, yeah. It, it, because the, the paraclete is that intercessor figure. Does he, it, like, is he bringing things through? Like, he does often no, voice. Not really. No, not really. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There, maybe there is something, like, there, maybe there is something there simply around, um, uh, around, like, not everybody needs to get a story. I don't know, like maybe this is this is me kind of reaching around a little bit more, but like um so like a lot of a lot of narratives that have mythic elements to them, like Star Wars and the Matrix and Lord of the Rings and a lot of these things, um, you know, you can do the Joseph Campbell hero's journey, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and I I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and of the hero's journey. Um, but I also understand how that can appear a very gendered and male gendered perspective. Um and uh, um, I've been like trying to to discover some like non strictly male versions of those of those uh, arcs, but then I've also come across Ursula K. Le Guin, who we should do a show on at some point. Um, 
and she has a the the carrier bag theory of fiction. Yes, so she rather does. than rather than the hero, do, do you want to take this away? Do you want to say no? You this? go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, um, rather than it being the a hero's, uh, I, I think she calls it like a spear story, a story about a hero going and doing something and killing something and coming back. The carrier bag is the story of like what it is to have something that holds other things, um, that can hold the seeds that you need, that can hold water, that can hold, you know, some something you care about. Um, and that a story, a carrier bag story can often be an assortment of things rather than um, uh, a, a story that has a, a thrust, if that makes sense. And I would say this movie does have a thrust, like it's it's trying to, to say something. Um, it is trying to not, it's trying to make that thrust as nonviolent as possible. It's maybe more like a, if not a thrust, perhaps it's a, it's the outreached arms of a hug. Um, but the, but that carry going back to that carrier bag thing is like just including someone who doesn't get a grand transformation is just a recognition that not everything in your world will and gets to apotheosize, you know, gets to reach the the promised land kind of thing, um, which I think itself is still valid. Like, it's still important to have to have that, like, oh, poor Alan didn't get an ending, you know? <laughs> That's so interesting. I love, I love this way of thinking about it. And the fact that you got to Le Guin's carrier bag theory <laughs> is the best thing that's happened to me today. But <laughs> uh, I love this. I also think when it comes to Alan, he is, they make a point to say that he is the only Alan, that there are all yeah. these Barbies and all these Kens. And there are a couple other one-offs, like they have Midge, mm -hmm. um, the pregnant Barbie that they, that like Mattel discontinued because that was creepy to have a pregnant Barbie. Um, <laughs> which I actually love that cameo. The woman who plays Midge is Emerald Fennell, who wrote and directed Promising Young Woman, oh. the Carrie Mulligan movie. And she's about to have another movie coming out later this year that looks chef's kiss. She's so, pregnant with another movie? <laughs> and that was it. We saw it in the Barbie <laughs> movie. Um, but I loved that Greta Gerwig like, asked her to cameo and, and yeah. be in the movie, this other very wonderful female writer director. Mm -hmm. Um, but Alan, so there's only one Alan in this mm -hmm. universe. And then he does not fit any stereotypes whatsoever. You're right. Like he's not a Ken. He does not get, um, patriarchy does not get him because he mm -hmm. is Alan, not Ken. Um, he's not a Barbie, but he does help the Barbies because he sees that this system is not helpful um, to, mm -hmm. and, you know, and he's going to leave. Like you mentioned that before, he's going to escape Barbie land before it can become Kendom or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and then ultimately is on the side of the Barbies. So I've read a lot of really interesting gender theory when it comes to Alan, like Alan mm. would be the non-binary figure in yeah, yeah. like, he's not Ken, he's not Barbie, he's in the middle. Um, but I agree that I don't know that the movie uses Alan in any kind of, or makes any kind of final point about Alan, yeah. which is why I'm so grateful for the carrier bag connection. Cause I do think that's really valid that like not every character in that movie needed a point or needed like their storyline to be wrapped up in a bow. Mm -hmm. um, Alan just kind of exists as part of the landscape. <laughs> He's just Alan. He's just Alan. He's <laughs> just Alan. I would be I'd be fascinated if like um you know like to to hear later like as more you know behind the scenes stuff come up if um cuz I'm sure someone will ask her like what's the deal with Alan um if either there's stuff that's on the cutting room floor either of the script or of the of the film um about Alan that that would be like just so fascinating to hear or if, like I was saying, like, if you assume, if I think that so much of the rest of the movie is so well put together, then I have to assume this is as well, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if that's, if that's true, then what are those, you know, what, what can you take from what's there? Um, but I mean, the other thing is that like, there's no movie that is finished, only released, <laughs> you know? 
Definitely. Definitely. So. Well, and, and I hope so too, because I would love to hear, I know that they did get their whole press tour in before everyone went on strike. Right. So we yeah. have more, uh, more interviews from the cast and crew than we mm -hmm. have, you know, than some of the other movies that came out later this summer. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a clip going around social media right now of Michael Sarah talking about how oh. he was cast in Barbie. And it was a last minute thing. They had cast an actor named Jonathan Groff and due to scheduling conflicts, he got a Broadway contract and he had to um, drop out of the movie. And so it was this last minute casting of Alan and they called Michael Sarah's manager and Michael Sarah's manager told Greta Gerwig that because it shot in London, he probably wasn't interested. <laughs> and Michael Sarah was like, panicked and was like, no, I'm very interested. And somehow got Greta Gerwig's email address and like emailed her and was like, don't listen to my manager. I'm very interested in being in your movie. And she just emailed him back like, here's a Zoom link. I'm just hanging out in this Zoom room, like come meet me. And he was like, this is the weirdest casting. Like, <laughs> Greta Gerwig was just hanging out on Zoom. And he joined the room and they started talking and then it happened very quickly. But I just thought that was so funny that his manager would be like, eh, Michael probably doesn't want to do it. Yeah, like, yeah. I definitely want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested, yeah. Which, I mean, there, there's sort of an interesting, I mean, we could do a whole other, I don't know, like a meta talk gnosis, pop gnosis episode around how you interpret the actions of the artists to make these things. Like, what is it for Michael Sarah to want to be Alan so bad? Like, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but we're not going to go there. That's a whole other, that's a whole other chain of reasoning. Um, uh, but one thing I did want to maybe mention, and this might be kind of a nice area to, to sort of wind our way down is um, uh, that like uh, Alan can be coded as non-binary or gay. Um, and which I think one thing that I think is interesting about the movie is that I don't think it is um, intentionally or specifically exclusive to non-binary gendered character uh, people. Like, I don't think it's ever trying to say that, um, you know, only women are women, if that makes sense. You know, only men can be men. Like, I think it's, um, but it is also, I think within this, within the space of the film doesn't really have the opportunity to say anything else, if that makes sense. Like it's not yeah. being exclusionary, but it's also not supporting. Well, it's not anything. And that's what yeah. I thought was also so interesting about a lot of the backlash that the Barbie movie was getting, which I think we're spending way too much time. Well, obviously we're not spending too much time thinking about the Barbie movie, but we're on this, exactly the right amount of time. <laughs> so we could spend so much more time, but, exactly. <laughs> but the backlash about the Barbie movie being like for gays and and trans people was hilarious to me because I was like the Barbie movie doesn't even touch gay or trans people except for the fact that there is a trans actress playing one of the Barbies but mm. um first of all if you couldn't tell I think that is great and yeah. part of the point yeah. um but also it has been said and this might need to be fact checked. Um, but apparently Greta Gerwig did not know that this actress was trans when she cast her. And oh. so again, no point is being made, right? Like that yeah. just is yeah. not to your point. That's not a part of this film at all. Mm -hmm. um, and something that might even be lacking like in this film. I, and I, again, I don't know where they would have put it in. I think that they were, making a lot of points about structure and like mm -hmm. systems, you know, how we structure yeah. our world and systems and how um, specifically men and women or, you know, Barbies or Kens are, mm -hmm. are living under this um, umbrella. But two things, I think the Alan is interesting because he, Alan's the only character that does not fit either mold and therefore mm -hmm the Alan character is not seduced by Barbie land or patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he does exist outside of these structures and therefore is able to kind of move independently of the structures. Mm -hmm. And I do being queer, I do think that there is an inherent, okay, 
this system was not made with me in mind or it's not doing me any favors. Mm -hmm. I'm already outside of it. Therefore, I can see it. I move differently through the world. You know, that's these are all very generalized statements. But yeah, I do yeah. think um, to be gender nonconforming, to be on the queer spectrum in a cis hetero, you mm -hmm. know, normative world, you do inherently live outside of those structures to begin with. So you're, you move differently through them. You're able to be a different kind of player in the world. Yeah. And I think one thing that's interesting is like, and this was actually kind of a surprise for me is when, uh, when Alan is fighting the Kens, the construction Kens, he takes them out. Like he is, he rocks those guys, like just pow, 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 which I was not expecting. Like, like um, I think partially because Michael Sarah is not known as an action play, sure. you know, like actor. Um, and because the character was often so like to the side of everything, like literally a depowered character. But where I'm going to going with this, what I think is really interesting is that uh, being outside of um, uh, being outside of a system can give you a lot of power in it, if that makes sense, or at least power to move through it. I'm kind of connecting to something you were saying there about being yeah. outside of the world and then therefore, therefore able to, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the second thing that I wanted to say about the Kens is that I had a long conversation with a friend of mine uh, named Nick Kepley, who is really big in the tarot space. They're, they have a podcast called In Search of Tarot. And um, they are non-binary, but assigned male at birth and do a lot of work looking at like tarot figures and kind of taking the gender binary out of that work. But we were talking a lot about gender in terms of bar the Barbie movie and how one thing that was highlighted in the in all of the Kens was actually kind of this inherent homoeroticism within patriarchy. Mm. Like when the Kens stopped focusing on Barbie and started focusing on what it meant to be men or Kens, all of a sudden, like they're slapping each other around, they're getting mm -hmm. in dance battles. Like we had this whole dream ballet sequence with the Kens <laughs> fighting. Like there was something just really homoerotic about the portrayal of the Kens under patriarchy that I actually think is present in like stereotypical manly culture. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. You know, like good play some good old American football. Let's see some men crash into each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Touch each other's bods. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know? No, I think, I think you're right. I think there is something maybe uh, there is there is maybe more gender questioning in this movie than is initially apparent, or than is like, than is is than is part of the main point of the movie. Yeah, but I think it's, it's there. Yeah, it's it's there, but it's in questions and inklings. Like it's definitely not. Um, which again, I'm not faulting. I think you can only do so much in the span of a couple of hours, yeah. and I thought that what. Barbie was able to explain about patriarchy and intersectional feminism and um, ideal world versus real world, you know, again, getting back to this Gnostic idea of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. looking beyond the veil or um, remembering things that that you had forgotten. Um, oh, oh, that's very apparent in how they bring all the women back, how they bring all the Barbies back. Right. Um, this like, you know, again, here's the knowledge. And then all of a sudden they snap to and they remember who they are and how they're connected to each other and in the world. So I just think there's a lot here. And oh, my I God. OK, <laughs> maybe one last thing. Uh, yeah. we, we, I know we, we, I should let you go, but I, no, just one no. last <laughs> is um, one of the one of the, the my favorite things from the Nag Hammadi Codex, uh, which is, again, if you're new to Gnosticism, if this is your first episode, is uh, kind of a classic welcome. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome. You know, we're, we're well, hopefully we've shown you we're warm and, and cuddly here. Uh, at least our brand of Gnosticism is warm and cuddly. Um, um, is uh, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, uh, the Nag Hammadi Codex is like one of the one of the one of the core uh, classical historical texts we have about Gnosticism, and everything before that was pretty much defined by people who were complaining about Gnosticism. Whereas this is people writing their own stuff. Uh, here's what we think. 
Um, and inside that text is uh, a text called Thunder Perfect Mind. And Thunder Perfect Mind is full of a generally feminine coded character speaking in, um, in, in paired statements that are often contradictory. Like, I am the mother, I am the virgin, I am the innocent, I am the corrupted, I am the whatever, I am the, you know, like, I am the red, I am the blue, like whatever the, the pairs could be. Um, and those are contradictory ideas. And what does Gloria use to, un, to, 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 to crack people out of the patriarchy is contradictory ideas. So I think there's something, yeah, like I'm, I have no idea if that. Look that's... at you just pulling out the Nag Hammadi Codex <laughs> in the final moment. <laughs> well, I needed the whole conversation to get me there. <laughs> yeah. No, but I love, I love that. And yeah, that's totally true. Like, I think that there is a real Gnostic nugget oh, trademark um, <laughs> in, in that moment of, of what, of how to break it out. Well, and I'm glad that you brought up the Nag Hammadi because the only thing that, the only piece of, of uh, research that Jason did that we haven't, like before this episode that we haven't spoken about for good, for fine reasons, <laughs> um, was, was someone putting connecting dots, getting their dopamine fix in, yeah, um, yeah. connecting all of these dots between Barbenheimer, like the Barbie right. and the Oppenheimer and all of these things. And one of their points was that um, Barbie, like something with Ruth happened in the same year, 1945, that the Nagamati Codex oh, right. was discovered. <laughs> <laughs> one of their points um, so it had to come up. It had to come yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And honestly, we need to do an episode on Oppenheimer. And then after we do an episode on Oppenheimer, then we'll do another episode about Barbenheimer, the phenomenon. Okay. Um, this is where it gets real. I have not seen Oppenheimer yet. Neither so, have I. <laughs> so donate to the Patreon <laughs> so that I can go see Oppenheimer. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> John exactly. Is be so proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> that is patreon.com slash gnostic, paypal.me slash gnostic, or you know, just tell a friend, share the show. That that's also a huge way to support us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't think I could do a better closeout than that. That was pretty good. I think that's um, it. Well, and and now we have an agenda. We have Oppenheimer, we have Barbenheimer. So exactly. send us your questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let us know what you thought of this. Um and uh yeah, and let it we'll, we'll talk to you all soon. Yay. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye.